Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. It was an emotional plea hearing today for a man who set fire to a building and that fire killed a San Antonio firefighter six years ago. Iman Johnson sentenced to 30 years this afternoon. Eric Hernandez has been tracking this case for the past few years and takes us inside the courtroom. Scott is a hero and he always will be. So with that being said, I want you to apologize to my wife, kids, and family, as well as the deans, the Vasquez, for what you put us all through. Former San Antonio firefighter Brad Phipps facing the man who started the fire that left him severely injured and killed his fellow firefighter, Scott Deem. Not a dry eye in the courtroom as Phipps, members of the Deem family, the San Antonio Fire Association, and SAFD Chief Hood gave victim impact statements. You didn't have the courage to admit that you made a mistake and come forward then. 16 minutes, their lives and our lives as an organization and a city, it changed forever. Johnson was expected to go to trial this September on several charges, but instead that 30-year plea deal was accepted. Something District Attorney Joe Gonzalez says was a decision made by the families involved. After conferring with the family and considering the options, um, th this was a family's wishes. They, they, they were willing to accept the 30 years. I mean, this brings closure to the family. It brings closure to, to, to the memory of, of Scott. It avoids a trial. Uh, it avoids the uncertainty of a jury verdict. This is closure for a case that has been ongoing for six years. Now, Johnson is eligible for parole after serving half his term, but because of time that he has already served being counted, that eligibility can be in about nine years. At the Kidder Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police and crime stoppers need your help finding a man they say shot and killed someone in their sleep. Police say the man you're about to see here shot and killed 35 year old Juan Martinez while he was sleeping behind a little Caesars on old Pearsall Road. This happened July 10th. The photos are blurry, but any information on this shooting, Crime Stoppers needs that. You're urged to call 210-224-7867. Crime Stoppers could pay up to $5,000 for any info that leads to an arrest. The police are also searching for two men they say attacked and carjacked a Lyft driver. Officers say the 61 year old victim picked up these two strangers on your screen, but when they got in his car, they hit him from the back of his head and threatened to kill him if he didn't get out of that car. Police say they stole the man's wallet after he got out of the car, then they took off. The car was recovered nearby with no signs of the suspect. If you know anything about this incident, call Crime Stoppers immediately. 41 migrants from Brownsville, Texas, bus to Los Angeles, California Tuesday night. 35 adults, six children on board. The Coalition for Humane Immigrant Rights of Los Angeles believes the trip was funded by the state of Texas. The group says the migrants will be connected with loved ones or sponsors up and down the West Coast. The governor's office has not commented on this latest bus trip. Imminent domain is the law that allows governments to force homeowners to sell their properties for new projects. And it's the reason that one family here in Texas could lose a home they've had for more than a century. Travis Upchurch is a fourth generation Aldine resident. He's trying to avoid moving out of his home after the Aldine ISD says they want to put a football stadium parking lot where his house sits. Upchurch says he's lived there for the last 46 years, and while eminent domain isn't a factor yet, Upchurch says he doesn't know why the district wants to expand into his property. If they need it, I can see it, but they don't never fill up the stadium when they have a football games. Upchurch's adult children are taking a stand against the school board, hoping to change their minds before they make a final decision. Denied water, razor wire traps, and pushing migrants back into the Rio Grande. The Texas Office of the Inspector General now launching an investigation into alleged mistreatment of migrants at the border by Texas DPS troopers. That's after a state trooper sent an email to a superior making those inhumane claims. As our Jonathan Cotto reports, now there are questions, though, on how transparent that state investigation might be. 
In an email, a state trooper working in Eagle Pass claimed he witnessed officers pushing adults and children, some of them infants, back into the Rio Grande once they reached the U.S. side. It's one of several concerns in the trooper's email that both DPS and the state inspector general's office are now looking into. In terms of people they're investigating or at least questioning will be the troopers that are actually serving on the border right now. It may also be their superiors who are, are giving orders. Um, and whether or not they're following through on those orders properly. Taylor believes the OIG is now involved in this case because of the Texas Whistleblower Act, a state law that provides protection to public employees who report suspected violations. But with one state agency investigating another, there are questions about transparency and impartiality. There is a trust factor here after what happened with Valde last year and the fact that the DPS appeared to drag its feet changed its story several times. Allegations of mistreatment may be just the tip of the iceberg. The U.S. State Department confirming Texas did not consult with the U.S. federal government before installing buoys in the Rio Grande and has so far not responded to request for more information. They're also in violation of international treaties and accords with Mexico that the United States has signed. And additionally, there are questions about human rights abuses that now all of a sudden, now you're talking about United Nations and other bodies being interested. Some state and federal lawmakers have called on the U.S. Department of Justice to get involved as well. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look outside with live cam 104 again today. We're on a bit of a streak here, Adam. Oh, we are on a streak and I'm going to take a look at our all time record 100 degree day streaks coming up in a few minutes. Notice a little bit of haze out there, but not a whole lot. We are expecting the African dust to get thicker uh, in the days ahead. We'll talk about that at 645. But as for now, it's all temperatures 104 the high today. That's the new update from the Weather Service. That's just two degrees shy of the record high temperature 110 the high in El Paso. Del Rio 107, Laredo 109, Dallas 105. We're all feeling the heat, even closer to the coast. Corpus Christi made it up to 100 and Beeville 101. I point that out because typically along the coast with the much higher humidity, their temperatures don't get quite as high, but they were pretty close to us today. We're going to talk more about the uh, temperature trend and how we're going to rank up compared to the record streak of 100 degree days in a bit. In many ways, it's the home that Tim Duncan built. A view from Drone 12 of the AT&T Center, home of the Spurs. And it seems to be at the center of a debate right now. In the last several weeks, many have asked, could the silver and black move out of this arena on the east side? But not for Austin, not leaving to Austin, but for downtown San Antonio. Case had learned from a source on Monday that the team in the city of San Antonio had been talking about the future of the franchise once its lease at the AT&T Center is up. Including a possible move to a downtown arena, though the details on where and how it would be funded aren't clear. Garrett Berger talked with East Siders to get their thoughts on a move on from the AT&T. From the decor to the name, there's no doubt that the identity of Ball Hogs Barbecue is tied to the Spurs team that plays next door. You know, they ball right there and we sell hog. Owner Hubert Brown says he gets business from fans going to or from games who need to catch an Uber. He's not keen on the idea of the Spurs moving. It brings people here to kind of see what's going on over here on the east side, so it will be a travesty. But he also says the county-owned stadium's presence has not done much to prompt a wider revitalization in the past two decades. But as far as what it all was supposed to be and they're going to develop everything and bring business here, they did not do any of that. At a barbershop further up Houston Street, an east side resident says a downtown move might be beneficial for fans, but also talked of the empty promise of development. They've been here 20 years and haven't fulfilled that promise. Let them stay here another 20 years and get it cleaned up, and then they can go wherever in the city they want to go. District 2 Councilman Jalen McKee Rodriguez, who represents the area, tweeted that the county-owned AT&T Center, quote, never fulfilled its promise to spur positive development on the east side and that a new stadium cannot and should not happen until there are steps to remedy this broken agreement. But not everyone sees it as a bust. David Edmonds lived near the stadium site for about 30 years before the center was built, and he says he sees people moving back. You know, there's not no big, big business, but the people are at least the businesses are not moving out like they were doing before the AT&T Center. What could happen if the Spurs move out is anyone's guess. 
A city hall source called the talks preliminary and informal, and the team has another nine years on its lease here at the AT&T Center. So any move, if it happens, isn't likely to happen soon. I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Now, earlier this week, we asked you if you would support a new downtown arena for the Spurs, and boy, did you answer. Shannon Sahabi says, no, AT&T is perfectly a fine stadium. Fix up mom and pop businesses and old buildings first. John Nally, on the other hand, says, take my money. Tommy Zooms says it should be at the Lone Star Brewery. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And Maxi 493 had this to say, I support the Spurs, period. As long as they stay in SA, the history won't leave with them. I want to thank all of you for your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And if you did not get a chance to weigh in, you can still be part of the conversation. Scan this QR code here on your screen. That will take you to KSAT.com where you can share your comments in one of our trending articles about the Spurs venue. And you can read what other people are still saying. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. I-10 at Hackberry, you can see one direction very slow going and the other direction pretty sparse at this hour. No real tie-ups to make you aware of. Coming up at 6.30, a San Antonio attorney says he was so troubled by the driving practices of a South Texas trucking firm, he reported them to federal authorities after settling a lawsuit against that company. That suit centered on a three vehicle wreck east of Little Rock in February of 2021. Attorney Sean Meckler said his background research on the company blamed the wreck blamed for the wreck showed that it was using a team driving concept. That's in which two people rotate driving the big rig to keep it on the road, delivering freight as much as possible. When you have team drivers, that truck is constantly in motion. You're making money all of the time as a company. The trucking firm settled that suit this year while admitting to no liability or wrongdoing by the driver or the company. The attorney, Meckler, filed a complaint with the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration accusing the trucking conglomerate of violating hours of service rules. The federal agency declined to open a new investigation but told Meckler it had cited that company for violating that rule last summer. KSAT investigates this team driving method and the potential risks to people on the road coming up a little bit later in this newscast. Also still to come here on the news at six, a new local women and children's hospital. KSAT has a first look at this new facility and what services it will soon offer. Tonight on the night beat, a company truck stolen twice in a month's time. What in pest control slogan is, you hate bugs, you're gonna love us. But the two setbacks are leaving their customers frustrated and cutting in to their bottom line. Corazon Ministry serves the most marginalized in our community, and they have a new leader now. Tonight on the Night Beat, you're gonna hear what her mission is as she leads the nonprofit. The real estate market is finally cooling off after the COVID-19 pandemic, but Texas is still top of mind for a lot of home buyers. Coming up tonight on the Night Beat, hear from a local agent talking how you can sell and buy this summer season. A one-stop shop for postpartum mothers with high-risk babies. That is the goal of University Health's brand new Women's and Children's Hospital. In case that got the first look, the doors won't open to patients until late August. But Courtney Friedman got to see how many services will be available in one place. Feeding NICU babies and high-risk infants awaiting surgery is a complicated task. We provide nutrition assessments to the babies at bedside. Rachel Jacob is one of four University Hospital dietitians that will work here at a center called A Mother's Place at the brand new Women's and Children's Hospital opening next month. We're going to be a centralized milk storage and prep space along with being able to connect those moms with the services for them to be successful. Moms can pump here or just drop off milk at the window, which will then be delivered to their babies with an inventory system allowing rare transparency. Moms know how much they're dropping off, how much is being utilized in the hospital, and then how much is gonna be coming home with them. And for the babies with special dietary needs, their milk heads here, a milk lab where measured amounts of formula are added to the breast milk. The moms originally come to these consultation rooms to talk about lactation, breast milk, and pumping, but because this is a one-stop shop, they also get to have conversations about diet and even mental health. We all hear about postpartum depression and the anxiety that might 
um, present itself after delivery, uh, especially for our NICU moms. Music to Lisa Brunsvold's ears. She's the interim CEO of the San Antonio Area Foundation, which donated $1 million for a mother's place. University Health serves as the center of health care for all of our community, but also for those that can't afford private health care or specialists. She says one of a kind care like this should be available to everyone. Just expanding that access to those individuals that come from zip codes that are in the most need. Ensuring success for all these little fighters and their families. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. All right, 103 degrees. I'm not sure what the record is today, but I know we're moving ever closer <laughs> to a record for most consecutive 100 degree days. At and I think we're going to break that record a week from Saturday. I think that's when we actually break that record and for the streak. Take a look at the graphic here. Today is our 12th 100 degree day in a row. Notice the record is 21 days in a row. I don't see any reason right now why we wouldn't break that record a week from this coming Saturday. I mean, look at our trend just going forward here the next seven days, low 100s, anywhere from 102 to basically 104 for high temperatures. The record high today, by the way, Steve, was 105, and we were a uh, little shy of that. 103 is what we're expecting on Friday, and that would be a record by one degree. Outside right now, we're at 103, dew point of 58. That's the key. It's keeping our heat index within check. So the heat index, the feels like temperature, is also 103 degrees. That's the nice thing. We're now in a trend where we're seeing our typical afternoon drop off in the humidity. Drier air mixes down. This was not the case back in June and early July when we had high humidity all day and unusually high humidity mostly because of all the rain that we had throughout the spring. Now we've dried out and it's creating at least some drier air in the afternoon. That is for us along the Gulf Coast. You don't get a break. That's our main moisture source and you don't get that break. Tomorrow's going to be the same. So the dew points and humidity is going to spike again after sunset. We'll start the day tomorrow with dew points in the mid 70s in the oppressive level. But then by the afternoon, those dew points drop down into the upper 50s, which completely eliminates the heat index or the feels like temperature. So let's give you the comparison right now. You look at the current reading, still low 100s for most of us. Stinson 105, Catula, Carrizo Springs, Crystal City area about 108, Uvalde 102. I'm going to slowly transition this into our heat index and notice that your location, it's not much of a difference. It's 105 is the heat index in Pleasanton and that's the temperature there. So we're not seeing a big change and that's the key. The heat index, not as big of a player. Whereas back in June, we hit our all time record heat index value of 117. I'll never forget it, but I don't want to relive it. I'll tell you that aquifer. It's down again today. It's still below 630 and this is the lowest level it's been since September of 2014. And we have a great article, by the way, on our website in the weather section that uh, explains this a little bit more and we could use the rain. Clearly the upper level heat high. It's going to split and elongate across the southern US over the next couple of days and then really establish itself over the western US, which puts us in this northerly flow aloft, which sometimes can give us some rain making energy or even the leftovers of thunderstorms in North Texas. It's just odds are not looking in our favor. Unfortunately, actually, we've had to drop those rain chances a little bit just down to 10% for Saturday and Sunday. So don't anticipate anything. What we will have is a little more variety in our sky and actually some puffy patchy afternoon clouds, but I had to dropped that rain chance and gave it the thumbs down this afternoon. Tomorrow we start at 77 by noon. We're 93 103. The high temperature of southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. Carrizo Springs tomorrow 107 Eagle Pass 104 101 in Kerrville Gonzalez 103 tomorrow downtown San Antonio 103. The high temperature a sunny dry stretch. And like I said before, I do think we're going to break that record streak of 100 degree days hey, at 645. I'm going to tell you when the African dust will be noticeable again in our sky. Okay, see you then. Oh, yeah, that'll be good to keep an eye out for. Thanks, Adam. All right, it is a trend I'm not happy about. Mm.
Friday nights are for high school football. Yes. Absolutely, yes. And UTSA head football coach Jeff Trailer says the exact same thing. He loves high school football. We know that because he was a high school football coach for years. But when it comes to the Roadrunners playing on Friday night, he gives it two thumbs down. Plus, Nick Saban. We are a little over six weeks away from UTSA football kicking off its 2023 campaign and first season in the American Athletic Conference. Head coach Jeff Trailer is entering his fourth season with UTSA and man has he turned them around going 30 and 10 overall and winning back to back conference USA championships. This season his schedule features two Friday night home games at the Alamo Dome Friday September 15th versus Army and Friday November 17th against South Florida. Earlier this week while talking with the media at the THSCA coaching convention in Houston, he was asked about those two Friday night games that will directly compete against high school football. I hate it. I'm against it. I can tell you it's not good for us because I can tell you what's going to really happen. What's going to really happen, they're not going to be at the Roadrunner game on Friday night. They're going to have their phone at Smithson Valley in Cibolo, and they're going to be watching the Roadrunners on Friday night. And they're not going to be in the Alamo Dome. Now, that ain't good for the Roadrunners. I'm, I'm worried about, about us. I, I get it. Y'all worry about Texas high school football. I am too. But it's not good for anybody, in my opinion. We need to stay off Friday nights. and Because uh, that's what it's going to really look like. I'm not teasing. They're going to be at Smithson Valley with their phone watching the Roadrunners on their phone instead of filling that Alamo Dome up where I need them. <laughs> Yeah, that sure is tough. The Roadrunners kick off the season Saturday, September 2nd at the Houston Cougars at 6 p.m. And the Texas Longhorns will kick off the 2023 football season at home Saturday, September 2nd with Rice at 2.30 in the afternoon. And then week two, we'll see the Longhorns travel to Tuscaloosa to face Nick Saban and the Alabama Crimson Tide. A big time matchup for the Horns who lost. Well, I can't evaluate their readiness to play in any game. I don't coach their team. Um, I have, think Sark's a great coach, and I think he'll have them ready. Um, so, but I think Texas has a lot of players back from last year's team. Obviously, it was a really close, tough game. You know, last year when we played that game, I think they're doing an outstanding job of recruiting. They're doing an outstanding job of developing the players on our team and on their team. And um, they're going to be, it's going to be a real challenging game, no doubt, um, because they have a lot of starters back and they have a lot of experience coming back and experienced quarterback. So um, we expect them to have an outstanding team. Texas will play at Alabama Saturday, September 9th at 6 p.m. Football coverage brought to you by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys right guard Zach Martin is reportedly considering not reporting the training camp because he's unhappy about his contract per ESPN's Adam Schefter. He says that Martin feels he's woefully underpaid relative to the market. According to Spotrack, Martin ranks ninth among NFL guards with an annual average salary of $14 million, putting him $6.5 million behind the number one paid guard in Atlanta Falcons' Chris Lindstrom. Martin is 32 years old and in nine NFL seasons, he's earned eight Pro Bowl nods and six first team all pro selections and camp starts next week. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. You'll be there. And I will be there. Case I told sports will be there. Yeah. Hope you got your long sleeve. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. We'll be right back. The trucking companies call it the team driving concept. One person drives the semi while the other rests in the back of the cab. It's used to increase the time spent on the road and maximize profits. One San Antonio attorney claimed in a lawsuit that that practice contributed to a crash that left his client with permanent injuries. Case that investigates Dylan Collier explores the collision of circumstances. <laughs> Dashboard camera video shows the moment a semi truck was hit from behind by another 18 wheeler east of Little Rock. The February 17, 2021 crash on ice covered roads came in the middle of an Arctic winter blast that caused catastrophic cold in portions of the southern United States. Driver Israel Rodriguez said his rig began sliding before hitting the semi in front of him and wiping out a smaller truck pulling a trailer later testifying that his tractor trailer had snow chains for its tires, but they were not on when the crash happened. A truck driver is potentially operating an 80,000 pound missile. Attorney Sean Meckler represents the man whose semi was rear-ended. He said his client suffered spinal injuries that will impact him the rest of his life. 
Six months after the crash, Meckler filed a lawsuit in Webb County against Rodriguez and the Laredo-based trucking company he was driving for. The conglomerate hauls more than 300 freight trailers under the names DX Express and Directo Express. While gathering evidence for the negligence suit, Meckler said he uncovered troubling information about the company's driving habits, specifically how long and how often Rodriguez had been behind the wheel. In a tape deposition, Rodriguez said after pulling off to be inspected at mile marker 22 outside Laredo, he then drove nonstop to Little Rock before stopping to refuel around 750 miles in all during one of the worst winter storms in the history of the southern United States. The crash occurred a short time later after he got onto Interstate 40 toward Memphis. Rodriguez testified that he had encountered ice on the road the entire stretch between Dallas and Little Rock. We know he was probably driving in excess of 18 to 20 hours at the time of the wreck. Then there's this, Rodriguez's testimony about his grueling work schedule. He claimed he would drive for 10 hours, switch with his teammate to rest in the sleeper berth for 10 hours, and then move back to driving, repeating the cycle for two months before taking time off and returning to Mexico. A safety coordinator for the trucking company testified that having a team driver allows them to technically never stop. Quote, so basically, it's always out making money. Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration rules require tractor trailer drivers to take breaks every eight hours and to limit the number of hours they can be on the road per day and on consecutive days. And they were just switching off every 10 hours, every 10 hours, every 10 hours. And if you, you know, extrapolate that data, that's a violation of the hours of service rules. After the trucking firm settled the case earlier this year for a six-figure amount, admitting to no liability or wrongdoing by Rodriguez or the company, Meckler took the unusual step of reporting Directo and DX to federal authorities, writing in his complaint that he is scared for the safety of the motoring public. FMCSA officials informed Meckler the agency would not conduct a new probe because it investigated the company in June of last year. Quote, the occurrence of noncompliance referred to in your complaint has been previously identified and is being addressed appropriately. For KSAT Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration records show Directo Express has had nine hours of service violations the past two years. Its sister company, the larger DX Express, has had 94 hours of service violations during that same period. The company's owner did not respond to phone calls seeking comment for the story. The trucking firm's attorney told KSAT he would have challenged Rodriguez's deposition testimony had the case gone to trial, and he says no violations occurred. Quote, Directo Express does not expect or condone breaking hours of service requirements. We'll be right back.